Hello everybody, um, Dr. Facer at uh, Greater Anodontics. We got another live case we want to show you. You know what, we're going to change this up just a tiny bit. If you, if you look, I'm talking to myself this time. This uh, case came in today. So in the, in the nature of being live, everything's going to be what happened today. And if you notice in the back corner of that screen, you might see people walking in and out and whatever because it's just the day in the life of my practice. Um, and hopefully the engagement this time is going to be a little bit different so I can be more engaged in what's happening. And then um, we'd appreciate any feedback you guys get that are attending or watching. You know, one of the things that would help us if you uh, click the notification button so you can keep current and doing these classes are and then comment. And so we can always improve and make a better video experience for learning. Um, this is going to be an interesting case, however. There's a few things I'm going to show you along the way that I, f I found kind of interesting. Some troubleshooting things, uh, which would be fun to learn on. And um, so let this begin. Um, we're going to get started here. By the way, let's just um, look at this little x-ray here. So it's tooth number 19. And it's one of those th um, classic cases. I've been getting these a lot lately where you know, we've got a deep filling, we got a kind of a pulp horn exposure right here, and um, some recurrent decay. And so the patient came in with a, with a pulpitis um, and tender to percussion. So we've got acute um, apical periodontitis going on. I'm just taking some lengths here. And uh, the workup's going to be just right, uh, let's go to my screen here, and let's get started. So. What's happened is um, we've, uh, we've anesthetized and um, Lindsay's going to hand me the rubber dam. And uh, I do a single placement of rubber dam, meaning I carry the, I used wing clamps in other words, so I'll carry the, uh, the rubber dam on with the clamp and then I'll go ahead and, and place it. Um, we, our routine is we will test that with cold before we begin just to ensure the patient's comfort. And then I'll just, uh, you know, go through my isolation protocol. So snapping over the rubber dam right now and checking the bow of the rubber dam and making certain that it's not going to rock or tip or dislodge. Um, patient's tongues sometimes are uh, going to fight us along the way and we've seen that before even in some of these videos. And um, I'm applying Oracil right now, um, and that's what's in my hand right here. Okay. Bite block is coming into place. Patient's been kind of informed if um, saliva is building up under the rubber dam to, that will point, and we'll just go ahead and uh, suction underneath there. The patient's mouth was a limited opening, and so what you saw Lindsay go off screen and come back on was essentially she, she, we didn't we wanted a smaller bite block, so um, went and got that. Okay, let's bring over this microscope here. It'll take you just a few seconds for me to uh, get that in focus. So we'll switch this over. Now, uh, you can see the kind of the old composite filling. You can kind of appreciate some of the marginal leakaging, leakages that are going on that's stained around the tooth. We can see wear facets on the, on the tooth. Just uh, the patient's been kind of grinding away. His, history of bruxism. Um, when I look at this filling, you know, the first thing is, you know, we can access through the filling and leave the margins and be really conservative that way or we can take that entire filling out. Um, and there's some advantages and disadvantages either way. But in a case like this, where I'm really suspecting this is going to be a leaking filling and there's gonna be some secondary decay going on, a recurrent decay going on underneath these, um, um, underneath a composite. So, you know, along the way, I'm just kind of, muscle memory's kicking in. I'm just starting my access and then I'm talking to myself and realizing I gotta, I gotta take this filling out. So you're gonna watch me go ahead and take this filling out. And by the way, you know, this isn't going to be edited. What you see is exactly what's, what's happening. And I'm already in there and I'm filling with this carbide bird that the pulpal floor is actually, or the, the roof of the 
the pulp or the uh, clusal or the filling floor is uh, soft. So um, I've definitely determined to remove the filling at this point, and I'm going to go ahead and remove all that. And I don't want any leaks, especially since this is a Genoa procedure. I don't want anything leaking around those margins or dislodging or loosening up that filling along the way. So it's very important that we're mindful of this. And you can start to appreciate the discoloration that's occurring here. All right. There we go. So just in that process, I'm bumping into the pulp horn already, even before I remove that decay. And so as I take this, uh, this is actually a, a month spur. You can use a slow speed burr or even your high speed if you really wanted just to drop in. But I'm just showing the recurrent decay in there and sort of the, the logic of why I removed the filling. Um, it does affect my axis shape. It's going to be, you know, not a ninja axis by any means. And uh, all that's happening is I'm removing this leathery uh, decay out of there and just finding my anatomy. I'm going to look into where the uh, orifices are and, and identify the hyperemic tissue. And this is kind of an interesting case because, you know, it's a very broad buccal lingual uh, mesial root. And, um, or, yeah. And you'll see that depth here, and we'll see a pretty broad isthmus in between uh, the, the mesial buccal and the mesial lingual uh, canal. And the same thing goes with the distal, although it's more scrunched up together. It's, it's, it's actually off center, it's a little bit rotated internally. Next thing is Lindsay's handing me, and, and I, we've talked about this, and you've perhaps seen this before, but this is just an SX Universal, and, and it's just basically an explorer for me at this point. I'm not interested in doing much coronal shaping or canal shaping. I'm just sort of picking and seeing what bites and what doesn't. Um, I want to dislodge any stones that may be involved. I want to find the orifices. Um, I am dealing with a, a limited opening. I think that's the, the day, you know, what it is to be an endodontist. No one knows how to open wide anymore. And my instrumentation protocol, I instantly went to uh, a 1506 file. And uh, it's, this is really just coronal shaping and a little bit more discovery on what's happening along there. Um, you know, the mesial root's fairly ischemic, and that was where the exposure was. So it makes sense why that tissue's um, more involved with bacteria, whereas that distal is more hyperemic. Um, you can see more pulp body in that, and hence, hence more bleeding. But we're going to pop that pulp tissue out. And, you know, when I go back and forth with these instruments, if you're paying attention to what Lindsay's doing, um, she'll swap sizes for me. I start with a 1506 just because there's a little more strength in the file, but then I'll go into a 1504. And 1504 just takes me a little further down in. And I'm being very mindful of my lengths. I'm going to stay shy of my lengths. I play this, I play this little game in my head where I'm sort of, I have a, I have a length from my comb beam and my x-ray, and um, I'm staying well shy of that. And then I'm going to be taking an apex locator. I'm going to try to get those to match up and try to confirm what I already thought I was going to be doing as far as length goes. And so then when I pass in um, a, a rotary instrument, I'm staying well shy of that. And that's, that's something that um, I've slowed down on. I think um, prior to Gentle Wave, my experience was I was going to length almost with every file every time. But now I'm being much more mindful of that anatomy in the apex and being much more mindful of what the natural shape likely was. And um, you can see myself now with my apex locator. I'm going to kind of get measure off the cable surface margin. And I've also changed, just doing the general, I've also modified how I actually use the apex locator. I always was taught and practiced um, kind of a patency pullback, meaning I would drop that apex locator out the apex. 
out the frame and, and then pull it back in. And that sort of pulling in was how I determined the most accurate length. But now it's a little bit different. I mean, I want to know the length. I want to know the, actually the ballpark of the length. And that's what's changed using the Genoway procedure. So I'm going to go down um, and follow the gauge on the electronic apex locator and get down to it. But I'm not, I'm not going to go out. And um, it's just something that's shifted, you know, once I've thought and been doing the Genoway procedure. And then I'll go back with my rotary file and I'm going right to now the 1504. I've got that dialed in. And now I'm going to stay a millimeter shy of that length. So in other words, I didn't do patency pullback with the EAL. And then I'm taking a 1504 and I'm just placing it down to that electronic apex locator length. And if you see that, I'm now beyond in that mesial, um, in the mesial roots, I'm kind of into pulp tissue. I found more pulp tissue down deep as I've kind of worked my way apically. And then um, this is hypochlorite that I'm uh, going to flush up any sort of bulk pulp that will come out. And there you go. And that's the instrumentation protocols. And, um, you know, I think when I started Genowave, I was really just using this as kind of an adjunct to what I already was doing. I, I saw the Genowave as kind of a, an accessory to what my technique was, my recipe. And it was just building upon my already, my already existing recipe of success. And now it's more of, it's a general procedure. So, so it's different. My files are doing a different kind of job. I mean, it, it's still removing pulp tissue. It's still sort of doing minimal shaping, but really I'm just trying to make the fluid have a pathway to go and be really effective and to do its job now, because now I'm going to hire the fluid to do the job of the file. And you know what, everything kind of always is matched. Everything lines up. We use an 04 file, we're gonna use 04 cone. And now where I'm not actively shaping those walls, we get a lot more additional morphology, um, whether that's accessory anatomy, secondary and tertiary canals, or just primary canal morphology is different. And sometimes that can be a struggle with matching our cones and we're gonna address that here in this, the video when we get to that step. What you watched me just do is I took a cotton ball kind of saturated with alcohol, and I, I just coat the entire working surface with it. And then I blow it dry. And everybody can build a platform differently, but for me, I'm gonna drop in a sponge. It's my little breadcrumb to find my way back home. And even though I have this sort of amorphous, <laughs> unique axis shape, I don't really care at this point. I'm covering everything with the sound sill because it's actually a, a time thing for me. It's not that I don't like being a finished carpenter in the mouth in this stage. I started out that way with kind of creating a gasket, but now it's just, I want it in and I'm not worried about how much sound seal I use. I want the more the merrier in my mind. And then I'm gonna light cure right on top of that. I'm gonna put that matrix right over, kind of push into that sponge and then my assistant's coming over as you see. And it looks like I've got another assistant in the room tell me about another patient, but She's just light curing right on top of that platform. And uh, <laughs> you can't over cure this stuff, at least in my mind. So, uh, you know, sometimes I'll just pop that off and, and you'll see that I always will put my thumb on it and, and, and I'll touch. And Lindsay's obviously going back to, to curing, but what I'm doing is I'm checking my thumb, the tactile sense, it just what's sticking on my, on my thumb on the glove and I'm making sure that that thing is set because it kind of sweats a little bit. Um, and there's the breadcrumb, meaning the sponge, and then we're going to just pop that out like a cork. Now, this is an interesting step. So I'm going to pause, if it will pause. Let's see if I can make this to pause. There we go. So the reason why I'm pausing this is I want to talk through what's really going on in my mind. Now, clearly, this little uh, matrix left an access hole that's not anything um, realistic to where my anatomy is or what I created. And again, I removed a filling underneath that, but I don't want flashing. And flashing is what you see right here. And I don't want that because as I learn and I've this general wave procedure and this general wave procedural instrument gets a personality of its own. And, and I learned to watch the exhaust, what comes out. And I found if I don't really have a smooth internal margin, I'll get sort of bubbles or turbulent flow coming up, and I don't want to misinterpret what that really is. If I've induced it iatrogenically, or if it's really coming from the seal itself, and I want to know the difference, and that's my job to know the difference. 
And so I'm going to address this now in, um, by taking my access burr back in there. And I'm really throttling it back. I don't, it's not full power. This stuff, the sound seal is soft. And uh, we're gonna clean that, dry it. And right here, you can see as I'm going down, I still have, I'm gonna wet mirror is what I've got, but I still have what's going on right here. And you know, I, I, I'm not there yet, even though I took that diamond access spur, so let's address it. And I don't wanna gouge it out, so I'm gonna take that slow speed and I'm just gonna remove this flashing again and just refine that internal abutment or that internal joint between what's natural tooth and what's sound seal. And I just want a really good exit. So let's take a look at this. All right, so now let's look at this anatomy here. Um, if I look at this anatomy here, I have um, isthmus, MLMB, I can see that that sound seal is set where that cavity was. It's filled in that, and I have a pretty now ideal sort of shape. So next thing I'm gonna do is Lindsay's already passing me what I need next, and that's these little depth gauges right here. And you know what, perio probe can also be appropriate. I like the depth gauge. Um, I always start long because I just wanna feel where that um, bottom of the floor is, and I like, their jigs, their depth gauges, because it vibrates. It's very easy for me to see. And I want to make sure that um, the floor, pulpal floor can have different heights. And so as I smooth, I'm wiggling this around, I want to feel if any bumps develop, because I might be good, good and clear on one spot, but maybe not the other spot. So once I understand that it's all clear, that's the size that I'm going to pick. So that's what's happening here. I'm using this depth gauge. Um, going to the next size down and finding that that is not, it's a number seven by the way, and it's not sort of, you know, bumping along the floor. So now I, I just thought about showing you this uh, right here. And so this isn't really part of the step, but I wanted to drive home the exhaust pathway because for me, it's something that's really important that I've learned from doing this thing. And you know, when you look at it, I've got the window and it, when it's hooked to the procedural instrument, that sound bar is gonna be right down there in the center. And of course, I want it to hover on the floor, but I, I wanna make sure that I have that millimeter room. And they talk about this sort of space being around the three, three and a half, four millimeter range. And it, you know, it's a perfect circle in the, in the procedural instrument, in the, in the device itself. My access isn't gonna be perfectly circular though. It's more trapezoidal. And so, um, when you, but when you look at that, you can see how it fits to the sound seal. There's this little triangular notch, and I can see that I got ample room. And I think this is a really good technique for the new users. Like, just learn it, just watch it, and then you'll get that muscle memory on how your access design should be. Because there's a catch to this uh, procedure, procedural instrument, meaning if I don't have, I don't want to suffocate the fluid exhaustion. If I do suffocate, at some point in time, as we're adding more fluid and it doesn't release, the pressure, the negative pressure that we're so in love with, with this procedure, it can, can, can break. And so it's very important. And I think from, for the beginner users, this is something that I, I would recommend doing. And then it's fun kind of looking through your anatomy from a different perspective. It mixes it up a bit. All right, so now I'm just, if you look over here, I'm gonna actually just put it on to the um, procedural instrument itself. I'm just snapping it on, and then I'll bring it back over, and it's color coordinated. Our life is super easy, and this is the Clearview uh, procedural instrument, or also sometimes it may, we make reference to it as a three-piece, but it's got the blue, um, it's got the blue marking that also shows that it was my depth. And then this first phase is the degassing phase. And while this is going on, I'm gonna just play this little explainer video that the company has put out. And, um, but in this degassing phase, I'm watching that it's clear. And I spent, I did my homework up front with that axis design 
so that it could be clear and then I know exactly what's going on and this is something that I've I spend a lot of time watching these um, and what it's doing is going to deliver the optimized fluid from the console through this procedural instrument it's going down in through this sound bar and if you watch over here it's going to explain to you what the the mechanism of action really is and so the sound flow and the sound bar is where and how the magic begins so in this video they're going to show this kind of pre-optimized fluid i mean it is water and bleach and edta but it it's coming through in a degas manner now mind you we have air in the lines and air in the tooth so this sort of degassing phase or leakage test is, is what it actually says on the console is actually exchanging what's going on in here and it's adding fluid and then as the fluid comes down through that sound bar and it interacts with the fluid in the chamber it creates a shear force and that's where the cavitation bubble comes and that's what these these bubbles are that we're watching and it's just sort of a bubble and then when it collapses it creates an echo wave and that's what they made reference to is this sort of broad spectrum acoustics because it's it's sound it's kind of like white noise if you will and it that it, it goes through that degas fluid really efficiently and that accelerates the chemistry it adds a mechanical component through the fluid to the chemistry or the hypochlorite and then it's has the ability then to go in three dimensions and it is following the path of least resistance but along the way it's dissolving organic material and it's hitting up against the the wall of the the dentin in that and it can get into spaces that you know otherwise we'd create smear or you know otherwise our files can't fork in the road so its job is to be an irrigant but it's also doing kind of the job of the file and then you just watch and learn and again um, you can see me I'm just watching my screen here and paying attention to what's coming out here and I I just watch now is a great time to learn some jokes or <laughs> pay attention to you know whatever's going on in social media or whatever you want to talk to your patient about or or whatever and you know in my life prior to the general wave procedures I would actually kind of have a working length natural stop I I'd take an x-ray and I let my my uh, solution soak inside the tooth and go to another room and my assistants basically entertaining the patient at that point but this time now I'm actually really engaged I'm really engaged and I'm really watching for any bubbles or any turbidity through these windows um, I want to know what's going on so I, I like feeling there's like a haptic sense sensation that you get there's an energy that's coming through this procedure instrument and I'm feeling it because then I can get used to the tolerances if something changes I'm going to be a really aware of that so I had to really change my practice sort of temperament a little bit like my workflow changed a little bit here and you know now um, you know I'm really nudging my assistants to to write the notes um, or I'll have a second assistant in the room to write the notes during this time but my butt's planted in that chair and uh, you saw me just check my watch off screen here and that's just because um, I got another patient next door that's getting ready to be seated here and you know what no news is good news I really don't want the feedback but I want to be aware if the feedbacks happening through here there's a cycle that's pre-programmed you can do an extended cycle but you have a time that you select for well it's you you basically select your diagnosis so in this case on the console what was happening um, kind of over here on the console on the bottom on the over by Lindsay in the right side of the screen is I'm I, she selected actually that this was a vital molar case and it sort of preps the console to receive the procedural instrument it reads it and then she's passing it over to me and then in, and then in between the fluids there's a rinse cycle so um, water will rinse out the hypochlorite out of the lines prior to in, um, bringing in the EDTA and they're, they're controlled the concentrations are actually controlled but I guess what I was saying is um, my pause times are, are different now and so my 
you know, workflow may be that I will get out of the room when I'm doing a cone fit. And so I've changed from a working length x-ray to sort of a cone fit x-ray. And I like that at the end. A lot of guys do it different, but my logic, you'll see why here, is every once in a while in the cone fit, something will come up. Like maybe the cone doesn't fit, even though your file was fitting. And maybe it has to do with it. We use fluid to clean the canals instead of a file. So we didn't cut this nice smooth walled shape. We left it and respected the original anatomy, the way it was sort of created to begin with. And um, sometimes that can crinkle your cones and you might have to address that. And so we'll troubleshoot that here when we get to that point. But that's kind of my workflow. The other thing that I've noticed is um, my patients have been really happy with it. It's kind of a, gen a really gentle hum. I've, I've heard it described as that from the patient's perspective. They just, it's very just flat. Um, I do really anesthetize them, however, in all fairness, I am I'm really anesthetizing them. I like um, an interosseous injection on lower molars, especially with pulpitises, and I find myself doing that because I, my patients just kind of get used to the sound. I mean, there's a sound going on in their own head with this procedure, and they're just sort of like, it's white noise. My patients do have noise-canceling headphones on, and they're just uh, watching TV in the ceiling, Netflix. And that's what the remote is in, in, their, in their hand. She's actually adjusting the Netflix, <laughs> picking another episode, whatever she's watching. And again, non-eventful, which is good. Oh, but what I was actually speaking of was the post-operative pain and that experience. And so, you know, one of, especially when I was getting used to the gentle wave, I was really paying attention to a lot of details and I wanted to know how recovery was and I want, I want to know what the norm was going to be with this experience, especially when you, you finish the gentle wave procedure and you, you, you find bleeding and bleeding always was associated with something wrong or bad. Bleeding, like what we're observing here, might be you know, attributed to like, just I over-instrumented or atrogenic error or something like that. And now it's sort of part of the procedure. So that another additional step that I, I learned about was, you know, introducing 3% um, sodium hypochlorite. And that is, sorry, let me, let me go back to, um, treatment here. I said the wrong thing. 3% saline is what I meant to say. And anyways, so it just sort of helps control the bleeding experience. And for the most part, it's pretty powerful. It works really well. In this case, it's worked really well. I've had have occasions where that's not, you know, you still deal with some sort of bleeding issues and there's some other techniques that you can employ here. And I think a lot of people kind of figure that out for themselves. But for me, my go-to is the 3% um, hypertonic saline. And I'm just now going to place my master codes. And, and one of the things that I just was getting involved in right there is I knew they were two to one, but I didn't feel like they were fitting all the way down. So what I just did is I put a smaller cone in. And my protocol of when I place cones, I always want to place them in the same sort of orchestrated movement. So I always start with the ML for whatever reason and go to the MB and then we'll kind of move them up and down and try to figure out which one has a better seat, which one gets to my working length a little bit easier and then that's the way I'll kind of stack them when they're two to one upon each other. And I'll do the same thing with the distal and for the most part I like the lingual before the buckle. I feel like I get more consistent placement of that cone to the to the apex and then I'll check my work. I'll, I'll do um, uh, a working length here and if I had a, a lot of pressure on me or if I had a patient getting ready to go next door or if it was a consult now's the time where I'll skedaddle out of the room and uh, go do that you can see that uh, Lindsay's going to do um, the x-ray here Um, I leave everything in place. I use a Nomad so nothing really moves. Um, don't want to disrupt that rubber dam. So let's see what happens here.
Okay, so we got something going on, don't we? I mean, when you look at this, let's talk about this for a minute. Um, when you look at the screen, we have, I think I got an arrow here I can move. You can see that this has been opened, cleaned both by a file and by the fluid and I'm well shy, this is where they're kind of coming together and that's what I was struggling with. They were, those cones were sort of bending. And at times you can just keep going smaller cones, although I'm, you know, I am using a 20 cone right now. And they, these are 20, 2004s, so you can use other cones. You can go to a 15, which can then crinkle along those walls. I'm, I was feeling that there was some morphology going on in those canals that were crinkling my cones. Now I have a choice to make. I may have to refine that shape just to obturate because we're sort of still held hostage to a protocol that you know may change in the future. But right now I have a protocol that I need to obturate to the standard that I'm given. And so I make a choice and the choice is I'm going to actually refine the shape so I can get the cone to go down to where I want it to go down. And I'm going to show you what I did. Okay, so those th cones are now garbage to me. They're done. Um, I'm going to go back to um, my uh, irrigant here, and I'm going to go back to a file, and I'm just seeing where the hang-up was. And so th this, is the, this is a 2004, and it's just dropping the length. I perceive no active work going on. And I'm just going right down to my, my corrected working lengths. And because I did put a file in um, post GenoWave, I'm going to flush it out with uh, sodium hypochlorite. Um, notice there's no bleeding going on. Maybe a tad bit, but not really. We've got all that pulp tissue under control. Um, people talk about are you introducing a smear in this level and obviously if we're putting a file in we're doing something but like I said I'm not really actively working anything in here and things are very sterile and clean from the gentle wave and so I'm going to then dry it with the micro suction and this kind of speaks to maybe perhaps a different way to obturate in the future but I'm going to dry it and bring over uh, a paper point and you know the paper points that I use are calibrated as well so I can always know where my lengths are now one other thing that you can appreciate is sort of the level of cleanliness that's going on here um, in that isthmus I mean that's something that you could try to make that another canal um, but you worry in the cross-sectional anatomy if it's sort of like kidney bean shaped and we could strip perf if we do that um, or trust that the fluid did it and for me I'm now to the point in my career where I'm trusting the fluid to do the job that's why I want want this technique it was a it was a deficiency I think we had as endodontists because I've seen a lot of issues from that space certainly in the retreatment space when I come back and I retreat and I think one of the things that you know, really like came apparent when I kind of shifted to this pro new protocol, this new experience, it, it taught me these details. And when I would go do a retreatment, I realized, man, is that just the insanity principle? Just redoing the root canal exactly the way it was shaped and just making it larger, just hollowing it out? Or now, am I really doing a different root canal? And I think that was something that then time had to test. I had to prove that to myself by my outcomes, just by following my recalls and seeing if I could perceive a difference. And I think my belief in the technology came from a retreatment experience, if I'm being really honest with everybody and myself. It's what kind of won me over. And then from there, I shifted into smaller anatomies and got my head wrapped around what, it was, what was possible and what the potential is in this. So now I'm gonna just make sure my environment is, is dry um, classically, I would call this a four-canaled, you know, two canals in each root. 
The isthmus and that distal is wide open now. In fact, if you look here, you can even see my paper point come down, bend, and actually, you know, common exit in that distal um, opposing canal. You can see it there, dry as a bone. So now, obturation. And for me, I'm using BC sealer. I, I go back and forth with different sealers. Um, I'm using BC sealer, and you can see as I'm injecting in the mesial lingual canal, I'm also filling up the mesial buccal canal, which is common. We just know it's clean and it's a circular loop. And it could have this isthmus communication coming in that Z plane or in that buccal lingual dimension. And um, that's something I, I like watching. And what I've started doing is backing filling all the way to the top because right there you start seeing this natural flow in there. And because this is a more minimal shape, I'm not creating a lot of vector force when I do a down pack with a greater taper, you know, an 06 or something like that. And you create a lot of that wedge dynamics as you, you push in one vector and the wedge shape goes in three vectors. And, you know, we minimize that. It's more to that natural anatomy shape. So um, I'm not relying upon that down pack like we did. We're not pushing people's chins down when we down pack. So I fill that sealer all the way up to the top and then I wouldn't call it a single cone technique. This is a back to that 20, you can see. But I'm, I'm putting it in and then I'm just sort of taking even a smaller heated instrument and I'm just kind of just dabbing in the top and you can feel where the diameter of the heated instrument binds and that's all I'm really doing. I'm taking it down to that point and then I just kind of pull it out. So it's still, I guess, a continuous wave, but it's modified for sure. Um, now, this is something that I do and people ask me why I do it and quite frankly, it makes me feel good. But what I did, I bent that one. So my Lindsay's gonna give me another one, but I'm gonna take another paper point back in that canal. And the idea is as I pushed the sealer in one canal, if there was fluid that couldn't be wicked out or dried out with microsuction and or uh, a paper point, that I'm putting that fluid in the other side. And so it makes me feel good to wick it out again, the paper point and reapply sealer. Um, I don't know if I'm alone on that, but that is something that I do. I've done that actually my whole career, even before um, Gentle Wave, so there's no question it's carryover bias. Um, but I don't want to leave anything in there at this point. I'm going to do the same thing in the distal um, canal now. Nothing's changing. Start with the distal lingual. I'm going to inject. I'm going to watch it come up. And again, if there's any fluids in that space, I'm going to um, re-dry it out after I place uh, my cone. Definitely a bigger space here. It's, I could take that heated instrument much, you know, much further into the canal than before. This is actually the fast set to BC as well that I'm using. Okay. Again, um, you know, I'm narrating, doing some pausing, but it's essentially an unedited video. And so this is real time. I, I do have a goal of, I want to be done under an hour. I just, I just do. And I was sort of under an hour um, in my previous technique, save some of these necrotic separation type cases. That's different. But for a vital case, I'm certainly going to be under an hour in yesteryears. And um, I still wanted to carry over so I can maintain my, my, my schedule. And then I'm, you know, I'm backfilling with a, um, a delivery system. This is the new um, Calamus, the cordless one. And uh, same technique, I'm going to inject in the DL 
and into the DB and down pack. Nick said, hello, Dr. Pacer. Hi, Nick. How are you? How far down are you injecting your sealer? So, uh, great question, Nick. Let me pause here. Um, so, how far do I down pack or inject the sealer was the question. And you know what? <laughs> as far as I can. So, I'm using, um, I think it's an ultra dent. I, I'm not sure the, the diameter, but I'm actually putting it directly onto the BC syringe. And uh, I'm going down to where it kind of gets a little snug, that tug back feel, if you remember that. We talked about, at least I was taught tug back with my cones and my files early on, apical gauging, all that kind of stuff in residency. But I'm kind of using those principles with the sealer, so I'm not actually forcing in it out, but I am getting down to that tug back zone. And then I'll actually go down, feel the tug back, and then go try to go right back to the point, and then I inject, and then I actually am lifting my hand up as I'm injecting it and you know wanting to watch it come up the other side so that that's probably a little bit more detail but that's that's how I do it um, I know that I've heard a lot of different techniques and some guys are a little more fo forceful and, and I've heard guys where they don't even use uh, master cones they're just kind of really binding the sealer and they're going right to thermoplasticized injections right there I'm not there yet personally um, still working in this manner. And the advantage of the one I just described with thermoplasticized, you may not ever have to go back and refine something. I, I actually use this case to talk about that because it's gonna happen if you do a cone fit technique at some point and you're gonna have to wrap your he head around what your comfort zone is if you are gonna be worried about reintroducing something or reintroducing smear and what do you do next? And um, I've wrapped my head around that and I'm showing you what I do and I'm very comfortable with this. Looks like we have another question. Sean Robertson said, I appreciate you sharing your knowledge, tricks, and reasoning behind what you do. Thanks. New General Wave user, so I appreciate the little tricks. Oh, you're welcome. And, and I actually thank you for saying that. And if you have other frustrations or things, please message me or let me know about it because I always throw up a video of how I've done it because I didn't, I mean, it was a learning curve. I, I want to share what I've learned. And man, like you just start learning things and, and who knows, maybe you'll be up here doing this, teaching me a thing or two. We're in this together, but it's, a, God, it's a, been a fun ride. I mean, it just is fun. I mean, the idea of trying to push the envelope and the idea of doing our better service for our patients to me is just exciting. And so hopefully when you get on your journey, you're pushing the envelope further than me. So. All right, so let's get me back in focus. Looks like I've lost my, my focus here. Um, you can see me up reaching. Okay, here we go. So now I'm gonna clean the chamber. So this, this case, I'm actually gonna temporize per the request of my referring doctor. And you know what? I always feel like we're judged by what, we, what they see upon entry, right or wrong. And they're human beings, our referring doctors are. And so I kinda like to just polish that up a bit um, obviously, I'm down packing here, but I'll, I'll take another burr, slow speed. I'm not wanting to cut anything, but I'm just actually hovering over that gutta perch in and just use it to clean out. Plus, I like tracing the outline of that isthmus. It just does me well. Um, I'm using a, a Munts burr here again, but I'll tell you another burr if, if you've ever used uh, Parapos. I know that's a four letter word these days using posts, but the burr itself to cut the post is actually a fantastic instrument to clean up a pulpal floor, another trick. Um, just pops everything up really nicely. Um, I didn't use that here, but that's another go-to. But I'm not doing it to create post space, I'm just doing it to clean, the excuse me, the chamber. They don't really cut the side walls or, 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 or do anything much other than end cutting into the gutta percha. Um, bendy brush with alcohol again, I'm just sort of cleaning up the, the floor, and then I'm gonna rinse it out, dry it, and then temporize. Looks like I got a little bit of perch in a wear facet. Right here. So um, if you're watching your clock on, Mike, what are we at on, as far as time on this? Is it should give us a time? Right now, I don't think you're see seeing the, the timer. We've changed the format with me kind of talking this way, and I used to have a little time clock, which we'll get added on the next one. 
but on my side, the procedure including anesthetic time, we, we didn't sit for five minutes waiting for the anesthetic or eight minutes or whatever it was to get the anesthetic on board. Um, but I'm at 42 minutes right now with that time of anesthetic. So true working time. Um, this will be much shorter in the sense that I brought you into the case right when I was placing the rubber dam on. But it's accurate. That's the time protocol that I work in. Um, you're you're going to see um, over here in this corner here, if I get it back focused, I do have the uh, X-tip cannula here. So now's the time to pull that out. You know, you can pull it out before, but if you leave it in, especially when I'm on like a first molar, if I ever had a problem, I can tuck the anesthetic problem, I can tuck that rubber dam back and reapply without changing or, or compromising my isolation. So that's another little trick that I do. And I've done that for a very long time. Um, people ask me what I anesthetize with, and I just, I actually use 1 to 100, the red stripe lidocaine. That um, does cause uh, the heart to beat, and I pre-warn, I joke with them, I say, hey, you're just burning extra calories, but it will, it's less than a minute experience, I walk them through that. Some practitioners, you know, don't want to put their patients through that, or they're worried about that, and then they'll use something like Sintonest, and that's fine too. I just like lidocaine. I, I do 90% of everything with lidocaine. Very rarely do I touch anything else. Second go around will be um, maybe uh, uh, Marcaine, but I don't really use Articaine, and there's nothing. I, I mean, there's people's opinions on it, but I don't use it. I just don't really have a need for it. And then there you go. That's sort of the outcome. Now, so I got another little arrow. If we walk, if I pause this here, um, let me go back over here and pause this. Yeah, so if I pause this here, um, there we go. So you can see this bend and um, sort of the anatomy here and really white here. And a lot of times with some of the way that the characterizations of genital wave obturations look, you know, they're not necessarily this crisp all the time. But that just has to do with how big that isthmus was in between. And you can definitely see we were painting and clean to the terminus here um, with some BC extrusion here and a little bit here. And some of these little undulations along the walls here, it, it may be along the walls here, are perhaps calcifespherites, um, little of that natural morphology because we're not planing those walls like we were. But I think the reason why I wanted to show you this case was how to modify a cone. I think that was something that I wish I knew a trick or something to wrap my brain around when it, as I was beginning this Genoa Wave journey. Um, the two visit to one visit's been a big change. Um, people have their definitions of two visits. And if I use the definition of two visits as being, you know, necrotic cases, calcium hydroxide every time, retreatments, those type of things. Two, vis two visits for me really were uh, necrotic cases, retreatment cases, but they were more defined by if I couldn't control the environment or if I had separation or, or something of that nature. Um, it, Vital cases were always one visit to me um, before the gentle wave. So I really wanted that emphasis on maintaining my um, practice philosophy and my workflow. And I've been able to do that with the gentle wave. I don't really feel like it's slowed me down. But like I said, I got the belief into this technology from necrotics and from um, retreatments. Um, and I feel like we have more of a defined endpoint. So between me and any other user, if we're using the protocol, the protocol is the same. So the actual disinfection part of our procedures are going to be the same in that. And so I feel like we have more apples to apples across the board, across the industry. And I think that's something that I, I hope we can get clinical trials and clinical outcomes from comparisons now across a, cr a big cross-section, multi-states and and I think the TDO influence is going to be helpful and useful in that um, arena. And then also tracking things like post-operative pain. But anecdotally, in my practice, I've noticed that dropping. Um, it, we prescribe much less anything, whether it be antibiotics or uh, analgesics. They're just, our numbers are down. And that's something else that I've really appreciated um, as well from my experience. So, you know what, I hope this was useful. I mean, the whole point of this is to be useful and raw and unedited. So thank you very much. Um, 
We'll have another one coming up, so stay tuned. Just if you can hit the notification and just comment so I know if this is worthwhile or not, I would really appreciate it. And uh, thanks again. See you later.